and had breakfast the next morning with President Bush and received the president's permission to go ahead. The Secretary of State would make an announcement later that day. Iran's negotiator was given the text. We are agreed with our European partners on the essential elements of a package containing both benefits if Iran makes the right choice and costs if it does not. As soon as Iran fully and verifiably suspends its enrichment and reprocessing activities, the United States will come to the table with our EU colleagues and meet with Iran's representatives. For the first time in almost three decades, the U.S. was offering to speak directly with Iran. Regime change was out. That policy had failed. We had tried regime. We had we had um, advocated regime change. We had a very threatening posture towards Iran for a number of years. It didn't produce any movement whatsoever. The Americans made it possible to offer the Iranians more than any of them had thought conceivable from civil nuclear power stations to the biggest prize of all, welcoming the Islamic Republic into the family of nations. Secretary Rice and I were quite buoyant. We felt that the Iranians were going to accept this offer. The offer was presented to Iran's negotiator by the EU's foreign policy chief. I tried to be as constructive as possible as friendly as possible to him, as respectful as possible to his country. They went into a side room with a translator. I went into some of the details that uh, we prefer not to be sat in the, in the formal meeting. Centrifuges for research were what Jack Straw had turned down two years earlier. This was a big concession to Iran. He said, whatever proposal you make to me here, I will have to, to discuss it with the other people in the, in the structure of power of, 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 of Tehran. And as you know, the structure of power of Tehran is not a simple matter. President Ahmadinejad was against the proposal. Larajani was in favor. But when he came to Brussels six weeks later, all he could do was turn on the charm. Yes was not there, no was not there. Yes but, and no but, it was full of that. And uh, in farce it's much easier to do that. In English is more difficult. You let us know, so that's a month later they met again. There now seemed to be enough support in the National Security Council for Larajani to take a half step forward. Larijani and Solana hatched a plan to open talks in New York during the UN General Assembly. The New York meeting was to be carefully choreographed. Iran would temporarily suspend enrichment and the West would suspend sanctions. The key was that the two sides would make these concessions at the same time. Larajani would come to New York, to the Waldorf Astoria. He would meet with the European foreign ministers and the Russians and Chinese 
foreign ministers. He would accept the basis of negotiations, and at that point, Secretary Rice could then enter the room, have dinner with them, sit down across from them, and have the very first conversation. To diplomacy, Dr. Prodigiani was very enthusiastic about that meeting with the permanent members of the Security Council. And to do that in New York at the time of the General Assembly was not a minor thing. New York would give Larajani the chance to win the argument in Iran. He'd get rid of hated sanctions. Receiving the public respect of world leaders would show that Iran was no longer a pariah state. The Americans were ready. We had formed a negotiating team. We'd done all sorts of research on how best to work with them. We'd thought through the various elements of what we would do and the pace of the negotiations. We were quite looking forward to it. We're working toward a diplomatic solution to this crisis. And as we do, we look to the day when you can live in freedom and America and Iran can be good friends and close partners in the cause of peace. The Iranians were due at the UN on Monday. The Friday before, the State Department got a message. Larajani would have minders. The Iranians sent word to us that they had to have a delegation of nearly 300 people accompany Larajani. None of them had visas. And Condi said to me, let's take away any excuse they have not to come. So I called our embassy in Bern in Switzerland and I said, could you please stay open throughout the entire weekend, issue several hundred visas, which they did. All the technical questions we have resolved. The visas were there, the travel arrangements were done. I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Mr. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. The Iranian who arrived in New York and who was the center of attention at the United Nations was not the nuclear negotiator. The president will have a press conference on Thursday. It seemed President Ahmadinejad had won the argument in Iran. Once uh, President Ahmadinejad uh, showed up in New York, uh, it was clear that uh, two were too many. The plane never took off. Larajani never took off from Tehran. He never made the trip. Those 300 people didn't get on the airplane. They never showed up in New York. And we were in New York thinking, well, maybe he'll come tomorrow or the next day or next week. Larajani was replaced by a much more hard-line negotiator, and Iran went ahead with its nuclear program. The West imposed more sanctions. Thirty years ago, Iran's revolution promised freedom from Western interference. But the Islamic Republic ended up also rejecting liberalism and secularism, the principles that govern Western society. The many dead on both sides have reinforced this bitter divide. It will be difficult for any new leader to shift the weight of history. We will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist. You can see all three parts of Iran and the West on the BBC iPlayer. Looking to the future, next on BBC Two, Stephen Fry with his Excel version of this week's QI.